Salutations, respected viewers. I'm George from Ireland. This video is about uh, Imagined Communities, the uh, book by uh, Benedict Anderson, but also then my musings on it and my extrapolations from it, partly my opinions, which have been somewhat inspired by when um, Dr. Anderson opined. Um, so a little bit about his background. I think it's always helpful to know about the author. So uh, Benedict Anderson uh, was a Marxist. Uh, he's no longer with us. He's been called to the great big lecture hall or library, whatever it is in the sky. Uh, he was a Don. That's an academic, not a Mafia Don. Um, and um, he was not against nationalism per se, but his book is um, really a study of nationalism, the modern nation state and so on. Identity. Where did it come from? Uh, is there any sense to it and so on? And how pernicious can it be? Now, um, Anderson said he wasn't against nationalism per se. He saw it could go very badly wrong. He was an anti-imperialist. Uh, he was an internationalist, uh, most of all. And he was very much a child of empire. So um, his background is intriguing. Um, he was born in China in 1936 into a British family. Uh, his father worked for the customs service there. It's because of the unequal treaties, Western countries control customs in China, as in goods that were imported or exported and what tariffs are to be charged and so forth. So then the war against Japan broke out and um, he, his mother and his uh, brother were evacuated um, to California. It was too dangerous to sail back to the British Isles. So even across the Pacific was risky. So he'd grown up in China for the first few of his life, spoke with an upper class um, British accent. Um, and then in California, uh, he got a bit of grief from the other children and he quickly developed an American accent. And the Second World War was over. It was time to go home, home for the first time in his life, at the age of 10, home, uh, to England because his mother was English. Except though he's British, his father was Irish um, and his father called himself British and really had no hesitation in working for the British government. So he went to uh, County Wexford in Ireland um, and there were Protestants on his father's side. So it was an unusual type of Irish, upper class Protestants, especially in the South. Um, but it was more complicated than that because his father's ancestors, the surname being Anderson, had immigrated to Ireland from Scotland in the 18th century. Though he did have some Catholic in-laws and relatives. Um, O'Gorman was one of the family names, I think one of his middle names actually. And he'd had um, ancestors who were active in the Home Rule Party. Indeed, one of the rebels of 1798 had been one of his forebears. Um, so that was that. Anyway, he went to Eton. And uh, when he went on holidays back to Ireland, he said he read prodigiously because there was no telly then. There was a radio Aaron, the only radio station they could receive. By the way, he had a brother called Perry, slightly younger, Peregrine, who also became a Marxist uh, writer. And anyway, he went up to, I think it's Trinity College, Cambridge, and covered himself in glory there, went on to study in the United States, achieved a PhD. So was fascinated by um, the Suez crisis in 1956. I won't go into that too much, but really raging against the last flexing of Britain's imperial muscles. Um, so as a Marxist, uh, he believed that nationality is nonsense, ought to be deconstructed. It's a false consciousness. Um, and he um, achieved mastery of a number of Southeast Asian languages and Indonesia became his special studies, uh, his area of special study. It had been the Dutch East Indies, India, uh, East Indies till shortly before. But anyway, into the real meat and potatoes of this book. And he said that um, modern nationalism, as we understand it, is um, to do with print. Um, and previously, books were all handwritten. And it's only in the very late uh, 15th century that William Caxton began printing books in England, of course, the Chinese been printing for centuries prior to that, which exposes another myth, this notion of Occidental superiority, or white mastery, the notion that whites are the most advanced technology and so on, the others should learn from us. No, at certain times, the Chinese have been streets ahead. Other periods, the Arabs or the, or the Ind Indians have been light years ahead of um, the West or whites or whatever you want to call people like that. Um, anyway, but in the Western world, so things were no longer written in, in, in um, Latin, they were written in vernacular languages more and more. And so there, certainly amongst the um, uh, intellectual elite, there was less of a sense of commonality and there was a wider literate community in each country. Because until the late 15th century, perhaps 10% of the population would be literate in many of these countries. And it increased uh, dramatically over the next couple of centuries. And obviously by the late 20th century, it was everybody. Um, 
So formalizing vernacular languages, translating the Bible, for instance, into common languages, and even people who couldn't um, read heard things, they read aloud to them the Bible, newspapers read aloud to the Chartists, or common sense read aloud to American revolutionaries. So the start of the mass media. Um, so his book is partly about how nationality is manufactured. People rail against artificiality in countries, but all countries are artificial to some extent. The historicity of many countries is, is deeply dubious. Um, it reminded me of this poster from Turkey in the 1930s, citizen speak Turkish, of having to introduce or to some extent impose a nationality on a polyglot set of peoples, on a multi-ethnic patchwork of states, not many of whom were ethnically Turkish, whatever ethnically Turkish even is. So nationality is often linked to language, but not always. It gets much more complicated. You can have India with hundreds of languages. Then you can have languages which are shared between several countries, English, like in the United States, UK, Australia, New Zealand, but they're not united. Almost nobody wants them to unite. So nationality is not new as such, but if we had a new understanding of it um, from, let's say, the 17th century onwards, so nationality is Prussian. It exists in a myriad different forms. It is forever in flux. It is not fixed. And that that's a myth that the nation is eternal and that the borders are eternal or the rest of it. These things are highly volatile. So how can something so changeable then be misperceived as changeless? It's staggering. Anyway, Anderson made a number of very telling observations. So one... There's this misconception that a nation is hoary. Um, in fact, some of them are very new. I remember studying um, Irish history an awful lot around the First World War. I can't remember which, which document it is. Was it the Democratic Programme? One of Sinn Féin's documents saying, Ireland was one of the four old nations in, nations in Europe, first recognised as a nation and blah, 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 and it cited some medieval document. I'm not saying that's wrong, but it was important to underscore the, the, the patrimony of nationality, claim it was very ancient. Anyway, his second deduction... The notion of nation is found all across the world, all right? Well, almost nobody says that they don't belong to a nation, that they're international or whatever. People have some kind of national identity, even if it's not relating to a homeland. Three, the idea of nationhood is very emotionally potent, um, even when it has a very flimsy basis in fact or logic. There are tombs of the unknown soldier in so many countries. I think the United Kingdom was the very first one when he was buried on the 11th of November 1919, as in the first anniversary of, um, of the armistice, end of the First World War, buried at Westminster Abbey, the National Valhalla, despite George V's objection saying, oh, this will disrupt processing up and down the aisle. No, it must be done. He could be for any unknown soldier. We don't know who he is. He's blown beyond recognition. His face has been blown off. Nowadays, of course, we could identify him by, by, by DNA. For every family who've never found the corpse of their relative, this grieving family can imagine it's theirs. Now, we know roughly where he came from, which battlefield in France, but nevertheless, the symbolism is important. And there's a tomb of the unknown soldier in, in Paris, in Washington, D.C., in Moscow, in Delhi, even though they cremate their dead, and on and on. So, to some extent, a nation is war, is born out of war. Its is, is borders are created forged by war, expanded, or indeed they contract, often due to war. So it's almost as though a nation needs enemies. In some cases, they do, probably in the case of Pakistan, or I hate to say it, probably the United States. I recall what Treitschke said, this German 19th century historian, a war sanctifies every cause. And in Irish Republicanism, um, Patrick Pierce was all about, about blood sacrifice to reawaken um, nationality. Uh, until 1916, Irish people not unhappy to be part of the United Kingdom, might want home rule, and didn't see Great Britain as necessarily inimical to Irishness or to Ireland being a contented country. So there's often this idea of land which is unredeemed, Italia Iridenta, or in the case of Northern Ireland, Hibernia Iridenta. We must get it back. There was a time in history, often in the very distant past, when the borders were correct. Our borders were correct. Well, it doesn't mean the borders in the rest of the world were correct, I suppose, at that time. Um, <clears throat> so what's a legitimate state? I was reading about um, Adam von Trott zu Sol, as in this German anti-Nazi, uh, killed in 1944 um, after the, in the July plot. But anyway, despite being very anti-Nazi, he did not regard uh, Czechoslovakia, Poland, have any right to exist. He thought that Germany was entitled to um, dismantle them, well, dissect them, what would I say? 
so <clears throat> nations, what do they mean to people? They're very easily summed up, and because they are visual, people comprehend them. Uh, I suppose it's the uh, availability heuristic at play. It's got a national anthem, it's got a flag, it's got a melody. Now, these are not, they don't all appeal to the sense of sight, but sometimes a sense of sound. Sports, even the dimmest person can understand football and can cheer when their team scores. It has this visceral power over people. It's almost impossible not to be thrilled. I remember showing pupils this song, Countries of the World, and they, they show lots of different countries just on the map, on the screen, and the flag on each country. And when it said the name of their country, in this case it was Turkey, they cheer, just so elated. That was them. That was good news. They could identify with that. Um, so it has symbols. It might have a coat of arms. Uh, it might have a motto, a national dish. Fascinatingly, in 1998, there was that English football song, Vindaloo. And it's just come from India about 50 years earlier. Prior to that, there were scarcely any Indian restaurants. I know the very first one was found about 1800, but it was not widespread, widespread at all. And despite the fact there'd be a lot of opposition to large-scale Indian immigration, nevertheless, English football fans, not the most uh, tolerant or accepting people in the world, had taken that to their hearts. They identified that as a core symbol of Englishness. It was very revealing. Anyway, if we go back to the pre-modern era, a nation was a fiefdom in the sense that it existed at all. And people didn't expect to necessarily have the same language as their rulers. Language was very localised. France would have had about two dozen languages or dialects, if you prefer, in the Middle Ages. And when people walked for a couple of days, started speaking, they couldn't understand the, the patois of the next place. They were speaking, I'm just trying to think, Valais, Niçois, Canois, uh, Languedoc, 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 uh, Occitan, and so on. Um, likewise, the same would have been true of Italy or really any place you care to name. Remember, most people didn't have horses and seldom went more than a couple of days' walk from their birthplace. And then Napoleon came along, called himself, himself Emperor of the French, not of France. It was an important paradigm shift. And when Belgium was created in 1830, the monarch was king of the Belgians, not of Belgium. Likewise, in 1871, when Germany was united, the ruler became German emperor, not emperor of Germany. It was scintillating. It said a lot, actually. But there we are. I mean, there'll be many local identities. The Germans, they all shared a language, but until 1871, they weren't one nation. Um, even then it was kind of quite touch and go. Had very strong identities existing well into the 20th century, still have some sort of a local identity. And okay, they'd had different dialects in German, still do, but you know, Martin Luther's translation of the Bible had somewhat united them. I think it was J.G. Fichte had wrote his um, address of the German nation. The very fact that he thought there was a German nation to, to address told you something. Well, Dr. Luther had written his address to the nobility of the German nation, which I suppose was a little bit different, because that, that's another point, is the higher people's social class is, the wider their identity is, more likely to travel, more likely to speak other languages, be literate in the old days and all the rest of it. Even today, the jet set fairly cosmopolitan, and the lower someone's socioeconomic status, often the more localised their identity is. It's scintillating. You'll see it in accent as well, speaking the vernacular accent of that region and not the standard accent. Um, uh, and more um, provincialist in their cultural tastes, just parochial, small-minded, small-minded, small-town mentality generally. But I'm, I did say generally, not in every case. That's important that that's realised. It's almost a perfect inversion of the Marxist paradigm because Anderson would say the class struggle matters, we must liberate the proletariat the world over, and nationality is the biggest obstacle to that. So it's all about pride and identity, and that, that leads to war. War is the last stage of imperialism, or he might have said of nationality. So, but some nations are, are very old, but what you'll so often see is a nation that's invented from the outside, defined by others. France is a Roman invention, it's Gaul. Okay, it was a few provinces, but the Romans just called them Gauls, various Celtic tribes. To these Latin speakers, the Gauls were all speaking the same thing, even though they were different Celtic languages. Different tribes are um, often hostile to each other. Spain created by the Romans as well, nearer Spain and further Spain and all the rest of it. Speaking various Celtic languages, oh, they're all Spanish so far as we're concerned. It's scintillating. And despite this having been, been, been created by invaders, nevertheless, the identity stuck. I know there are very strong identities within that. It was resisted for a long time, and, but it was created, or in the sense of Spain, I suppose, recreated. 1492, the Reconquista is completed. 
the Moors, that's these North African Muslims, are finally defeated with the fall of Granada, and Spain is united. It didn't officially become a single realm until 1700. So it was Ferdinand and Isabella, the Catholic monarchs as they are known, who were monarchs of different Spanish kingdoms. There are a few other Spanish kingdoms under their paramountcy, and that was that. So they say that they reconquered Spain, possibly not. You might say, no, they conquered Spain for the very first time. The Andalusians, the people at the very south of Spain, be fighting against them. Now, there's some people will say, the Andalusians say, Christian or Muslim, we don't care, we are Andalusia. We're defending our homeland against these people from Castile, that central Spain, the invaders. That's one way to see it, that really that was just propaganda, that was a Spanish nationalist nonsense to claim that the Christians in the south were really Spanish, perceived themselves as Spanish, wanted to be part of a, a Spain that was united or even semi-united. So there sometimes are seismic changes in terms of uh, nationality. Look at the Congress of Berlin, 1885, where um, there have been mere pimples on the coast of Africa, which were European colonies, British, British, French, Portuguese, even Danish ports on the coast until about 1800, then started to penetrate a little bit deeper. South Africa was the only place where there was a significant amount of European settlement because the climate was favourable. No, would say, say, fly, there's a Mediterranean climate and good arable land. OK, a little bit Algeria too, some French settlers. The so-called French in Algeria were often actually uh, Spanish, Italian, Maltese, even German, but becoming French citizens. Uh, and so speaking French, being a French citizen, being a Christian, that was their identity. That was what made them French. Um, so in a, there then Africa was divided up in 1885 at a conference at which it's not a single African attended. It was astonishing. And the nation states we have today, 150 years later, um, are because of that. So you'll see that nations are marked by appearance, disappearance, reappearance. Look at Poland, the third partition of Poland uh, by the end of the 18th century. Another partition, of course, um, in 1939, came back again, 1945, with different borders again. And yet Poland is not dead. So despite Poland being wiped off the map for a century, most of the 19th century, up until 1918, um, the Polish identity was scarcely smothered, was almost as strong. You notice a lot of um, socialist revolutions in Russia were actually Polish, and were more Polish nationalist than left-wing in their orientation. Josef Piłsudski, the future um, military dictator of Poland, being one of them, despite in Poland him being regarded as a highly conservative figure. Look at gypsies, another example of a disembodied nationality. They definitely know they're gypsies, but they don't have a homeland. They left Gujarat a thousand years ago. So far as I know, there's no thought of returning home. They're more proportionally the highest in, in, in Slovakia. Largest concentrations, largest other concentrations in other European countries like places like Romania. But that's that. So are they a nation? It's arguable. The Knights of Malta, possibly they're a nation. So um, images, statues, that's what appeals to people, that's what people can recognise, Statue of Liberty and so on. Even for Americans who've never been to New York, who think that New York is a den of vice. I remember there's a Woody Allen film in which he's playing uh, squash against another New Yorker and he says, the rest of the country thinks that we're um, uh, communist, Jewish, atheist, homosexual pornographers. I think that too myself sometimes and I live here. So I remember some Irish people who were in, who were in the United States in the, in the 70s, in Texas actually, and they said what stunned them is they hadn't realized the geographical diversity of the United States, perhaps they were naive in not doing so, but the way that some people in Texas were very anti-New York and thought it was, um, you know, the, the root of all evil. It was like a den of iniquity. People, it was un-American. Those people who'd been there in New York, even for generations, had failed. They were in, they were in slums. Occasionally that was true. Anyway, back more back to national symbols like Marianne in France, which was on the banknote that topless lady, but they, st they still choose a, a young woman to represent them to personify France. Um, I wonder if they've chosen a black woman yet, but it was Catherine Deneuve in the, in the 60s. Pounds, euros, a symbol of uh, your nation. Is the European Union a nation? And that's another scintillating question for another, another um, video. Is there European nationalism? I remember putting this to Dr. Alan Sked, the founder of UKIP. He left UKIP 20 years ago. But Sked said it's possible that a European national identity could emerge, and perhaps it is actually. You see even all these anti-Brexit protesters in the United Kingdom swathed in the European Union flag. 
The thing is, if someone to walk around in the Union flag as a, as, a, as a cape, that's the British flag, people would say this person is an ultra-nationalist, he or she is a racist, a white supremacist. Well, unfortunately, it's been misappropriated by racists sometimes, but we shouldn't imagine that all the time. I, I've gone around in, a, uh, in an Irish tricolour, I've gone around in a Union flag. No contradiction in doing that. But um, uh, people don't think I'm a racist because I wear an Irish tricolour. I remember the Liberal Democrat leader, what was his name, Charles Kennedy, died a couple of years ago. But anyway, Kennedy's saying, I see no contradiction whatsoever in being a Highlander, a Scotsman, a Briton and a European. And he could have added several more level, levels to that identity. But um, yeah, I agree with him, actually, although I'm not a Europhile. Europe and the European Union are not the same. Europe existed long before the European Union was ever thought of. The myth of the mistake. And that's the other thing is the boundaries. Why should it be here? And they're often based on myths. Europa, what a nymph. This uh, ravishing young woman, a mythological creature who hangs around uh, the shore or a lakeside, um, never born, just appear as an adolescent. And then Zeus, the king of the Greek gods, wants to seduce her. But she went forth with the Greek king of the Greek pantheon. So what does he do? The obvious thing, if you want to seduce someone, turn yourself into a white bull. He then copulates with her. Well, you can probably buy it. You can probably buy a video of that in Amsterdam. But anyway, that's the basis of Europe. This myth it might be offensive to some Muslims, perhaps. You don't want to believe in Greek mythology. So why should Europe be where it is? Why should this country be in and that? And is Russia in Europe up to the Urals or not? It's debatable, but Russians talk about Europe as somewhere else. But sometimes they say they're European. I remember Lukashenko, the president of, of, of Belarus, praising Dr. Assad, the president of Syria, saying he's a very European person. As if that was a good thing. That was scintillating. I wouldn't have thought he'd say something like that. Anyway, um, Asia, just a village on the um, Anatolian Peninsula near Istanbul. Asawa, it originally was Asawa, which spread out to mean the whole of Ant Anatolia, which spread out to mean the whole of the continent of Asia. So these divisions are completely arbitrary. Why should it be here and not there? I know we go by some geographical boundaries, but why this river and not that river? Or why this mountain summit and not the summit of the next one? And on and on. Now, the only conversation I ever had with um, Leo Varadkar, he's the Taoiseach of the Republic of Ireland, and he said, you know, uh, well, that, you know, pound sterling are an important proof of nationality, and I can see why people in Britain, you know, want to keep it. We used to have Irish pounds in the Republic of Ireland, so we left the UK, we started printing our own currency, but it was exactly the same value as sterling, and we accepted British pounds in the Republic of Ireland. Likewise, in Northern Ireland, there's the, 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 the pound saying Ulster Bank, that is sterling. And those Bank of Scotland, the Royal Bank of Scotland and the Clydesdale Bank of Scotland, they print the different notes, the same value. In England, Wales simply says Bank of England. You can use a Bank of England one that's in the rest of the UK, Bank of Scotland ones and so on, you find difficult to spend in England. So it's scintillating that even though it's the same currency, people want to go to the trouble of printing it on different paper, despite the expense of it looking different, despite the inconvenience. Like several West African countries or equatorial African countries sh share the CFA, as in Franc Communité, Communité Financière Africaine. So French, sorry, what was it? African Financial Community, which used to be pegged to the franc for these uh, former French colonies, is now pegged to the euro, goes up and down uh, with them. So have they lost their nationality? Well, I don't think so. But there was talk of uniting several of these African colonies together, make them mightier. But the African Union has gone a long way towards that in the past 20 years. So look at India with its rupee. Been around for centuries. Pakistan still calls its currency the rupee. So, do, so does um, Sri Lanka. But Bangladesh calls theirs, calls theirs the taka. I'm not quite sure to, to distinguish themselves from the others. But anyway, as I say, sport and football teams, I think, did a lot to forge nationality. That can get through to the, to the average person. 1863, the Football Association founded, and that's really the first major sport which is organised on a national basis, then a professional basis, international rules, and everybody knows what that know what that's about. If you took away, you know, these sports and flags, national entity would be much feebler. So Italy was a geographical concept, as Metternich said. Um, uh, so he didn't think it could be politically united. Remember, it was 24 countries or so, states, countries, states. Are these words coterminous? Sometimes. Until 1861. Even now, Italianification isn't complete. Look at the Vatican City, San Marino, Nice, Ticino. Uh, many more examples of that. 
Of course, we go back to the 18th century, these microstates like Nice, Monaco, the Vatican City, there were dozens of them all across Europe. They were the norm, not the exception. Um, and once Italy was united, I can't remember which Italian statesman said it, maybe Count Camillo di Cavour said, now, we, now we've made Italy, so now we'll make Italians. So conscription would maybe form their nationality, move them to other parts of the country. The Turks did so as well, sending someone from Istanbul to Eastern An Anatolia and vice versa. I met some Azerbaijani army conscripts on a sort of nation building tour, a bit of a pep talk, visiting one of their ancient monuments. And going around London, I sometimes see um, Gurkhas in, in, in suits being shown the sights, maybe to imbue them with some pride in the United Kingdom. They're not British citizens, but maybe to make them want to be. I'm not quite sure what the aim is. So nationality is to some extent manufactured. I look at schooling in the United States in the uh, late 19th century, when they had to absorb a huge number of European immigrants. Okay, putting the flag up everywhere and the state flag and the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the Republic, to the flag and the Republic for which it stands. Is it with liberty and justice for all, one nation under God? I've got a bit wrong. So many people where I come from consider that over the top, totalitarian, unpalatable. I think it's a bit distasteful. It's not terrible to do it occasionally, but every single day, you think it would devalue it. People would just mumble it all almost meaninglessly. And if you're not a citizen, you might not like it. Well, you are in the United States, accept it. And you can become a citizen, obviously. Now, my great grandmother lived in the United States for several years. This is in the 1890s and didn't become a citizen. Surprising, there's a formality in those days. So um, having to tell people they belong to this or that nationality and, and din it into them in school. And in the 19th century, you'll see many, many countries doing this and uh, promoting the official language. In France, French is the official language. That's uh, it, the others have no standing. In school, like in Britain, you learn French. You can learn a foreign language like German, but you do not learn Breton. In court, anything that dealing with the state is, Bret is, is French. Okay, you can have a theater or performing in Breton or newspapers and books, but the state will do nothing uh, in Breton or any other language. And that was a very common process. You'll see the same going on in, in France, in Russia, in Italy, um, in Spain, and in the United Kingdom. I know in Ireland, people are often complaining, oh, we had to learn English at school, no Irish. You could get hit with a stick if you spoke Irish. We well, got hit with a stick for well nigh all into the mid 20th century. Obviously, the children shouldn't be hit for doing something, well, that's not even wrong, it's not even bad. But it was empowering us by learning the language. And of course, people were still permitted to speak Irish, but the education was in English. And that's what gave us tremendous opportunities. Uh, besides, people from Great Britain were the only ones who arrived in the United States already speaking fluent English and indeed literate. I mean, very few other nationalities were literate um, in huge numbers by the late 19th century. Maybe the Germans, but mass literacy was the exception, not the norm at the time. So another thing is, is the misconceptions and the things that were really, really, uh, how to put it, slaughter some sacred cows will blow some people's preconceptions out of the water. Where is England originally? The real England. The real England is in Germany. England is a peninsula in Germany. It's in Schleswig-Holstein, very close to the Danish frontier. That is the original England. So the 4th century AD, the Angles, the Saxons and Jutes from what is now Germany and Denmark sailed over to attack England, what we call England. Um, the mainland bit of, of, of Denmark is, is, is Jutland or Jylland in their language. And they attacked England. They defeated the, um, uh, the ancient Britons and the Romans. The Roman legionaries were, were drawing and that was that. So um, they were Angles, but that got turned into English. So the Venerable Bede, that monk at Jarrow, he wrote his Ecclesiastical History of the English Church in Latin in um, uh, 735 AD. The first book to mention the words England or English. He's got Angles and Saxons. He could have called the country uh, Saxony, just like in Germany, or the people Saxish, but he went for English. Would the world have been different if he'd gone for the other one? Almost at random, he picked that. We often talk about Anglo-Saxons, they intermarried and completely blurred into each other after a few centuries. Anyway, you can see his, do his tomb, I'm about to say doom. There is a Freudian slip in Durham Cathedral. Oddly, the town he comes from was such a dump, only known for, for the Jarrah Crusade of 1836, that march of the unemployed to London, led by Dame Eleanor Wilkinson, with a Labour MP, first woman, Labour woman MP. Anyway, I digress. So then even when they conquered England, uh, England in England itself met, meant East Anglia and West Anglia, 
West Anglia would now call it the East Midlands. So places like Nottinghamshire, Norfolk, Suffolk, Cambridgeshire, Huntingdonshire, Northamptonshire, that was England, nowhere else. But the concept of England spread further and further out. So the borders wax and wane. Like Sweden, the Sweden proper, a small area of southern Sweden, that was the original Sweden. Or Russia was born in Kiev and eventually expanded to the Moscow area and expanded a bit further north and eventually went all the way to meaning Alaska. And the real Russia, the original Russia, is not even part of Russia anymore. And some Russians don't accept that, want Kiev back. A bit like Montenegro being very important to the identity of Serbians, despite very few Serbians living there, because the field of the Blackbird, where they lost that battle. So Scotland ruled northern England for centuries. You know, Scotland was at least a fifth bigger than it is now. Wales was once double its current size. Remember, the Scots were an Irish tribe who conquered a bit of Caledonia. There was this kingdom, Dalriadia, which spanned the North Channel from the northern bit of Ireland to the southwest bit of Scotland. St. Patrick, the saint of our isle, was from Great Britain. We often say Wales, we just don't know. But um, he was from the... So, so Ireland, what does it mean? Pro possibly derived from Iher, as in our word for West. There's another theory that it's, it's from Eriu, one of our pagan goddesses, which again is ironic in view of the fact that Christianity was so important to identity for a long time, particularly Catholic Christianity. Anyway, I could go on and on all night. I think half an hour is quite enough for the beginning of this uh, talk.